bottom wire. So first of all, what you're going to look at is, I'm trying to see how to turn your camera off the time, is a normal distribution of the residuals. And the mean of the residuals will always be one. So, if we standardize them, when we standardize the residuals, then it gets a mean of what and a standard deviation of what? Zero. Mean of zero, standard deviation of what? So, one thing you're going to look at, let me do this on the board here, is you're going to look at your standardized residuals. There's no hard and fast rule. But generally, generally, if the standardized residual is greater or equal to about 3, plus or minus 3, you got yourself an outline. Again, some use 2, some use 2.0. I don't think it's coming up because you have a, a green light that usually comes up on the side over there. I know, right here. It's well, green. over here on the, on no, the side, there's a little light that usually comes on if it's warming up. Right, fine, and it's just like when it timed out, I saw it go to zero. No, I didn't catch it for it. Okay. Oh, okay, so right, so turn off, which is fine. Sure. Okay. If I fall, everybody. It's on film. It's on film. <laughs> First person to tell me that. My <laughs> eighth grade drama teacher once said. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, now we know. Just go up there on the seat of that. There you go. So you look at the standardized residuals, everybody. And you hope A are distributed normal. Now, here we have some residuals. Overall, I think I'm a healthy person. You know what's interesting? This is a, a Likert item, which shows you even for an item that's Likert, you can have normally distributed residuals. So look at the residuals, everybody. Look at homoskedasticity. The homoskedasticity is going to look weird because it's a 5, right? It's a Likert item. And, so let's say, you want to look at the residuals, and just want to show you right here. Let's say I have 
the equation such as this. Let's say I have an equation where I'm going to use depression and your pulse rate to have some outcome. There's the intercept and there's the slopes, the residuals y minus predicted y, right? Remember all that from 6022? So this is just a small little database, everybody, using depression and your pulse rate to predict performance. As you know, wellness programs are really big in organizations now. Does anyone ever work for an organization that has a wellness? Do they have a, what type of program do they have? They did a, a weight loss competition with pedometers and really? weekly weigh-ins and a nutritionist and all that kind of stuff. What'd you think about that? Uh, it was good. Mm -hmm. So, here you have depression, pulse performance. You see the predicted score, everybody? So you plug in an equation, you get a predicted score for every single person. For that person, who has a 98, did we over or under predict? 98 and we predicted under performance, predict. right? Under predict. Over, right? They have 98 and we predicted 117. So we over predicted. Oh, over, over. Hence the negative residual, right? Hence the negative residual. So everybody sees that, right? The negative residual. Then, what you have is, this is the standard deviation form. I bet you if you took the minus 19, if you took that minus 19 and divide it by the standard deviation of residuals, there you'd see that, that individual is 1.14 standard deviations below the mean. And that's all that is right there, everybody. That's the negative residual. So do you see the biggest one is right there that I bolded? This individual, they got a 3 on depression, their pulse is 43, performance is 193, which is the DV, so you see they're the highest performer. And since we have a predicted score, 156, we under-predicted that person. And they're 2.20 standard deviations below the mean. So that, everybody, from this database, from this database, that is the largest residual. Which means, why I point this is, Though you may use rules of thumb such as standardized residual greater than absolute value, greater than 3.0 as an outlier, Get in the habit of looking at largest, smallest from your data set, right? From your data set. Because if you have a small sample size, guess what? You get 2.20, maybe actually pretty big. Because with a really small data set, you're not going to have any 3 .0s. So that is the outlier, right? The standardized residual is the outlier on the outcome. Right, so, ZRE, standardized residual, is outlier on the TV. But then you get outliers on the set of predictors. And in SPSS, they call it leverage, or LEV, underscore Y. And leverage is an outlier on the set of predictors. On the set of predictors. Which means, one way to look at it, what if I had cholesterol, drinking, and leadership skills? And those are three predictors. So someone's got a cholesterol of 200, drinking, they have seven drinks a week, and 12 on leadership. 198, 610. Do these two people seem kind of similar on their profile on the X's? Well, look at Justin, because he brought it up last year. 345, look at his cholesterol, look at his drinking, and look at his leadership skills. Obviously, this is an extreme example. But is that person an outlier on the set of predictors? Absolutely. So leverage, when you look at the formula, everybody, when you look at the outliers on the set of predictors, it's a function. It's a function of all the x's. Of all the x's. And that's outliers on the set of predictors. So that's all leverage is, everybody. There's no hard and fast rule. But, for large outlier, everybody, I'm sorry, for large leverage, 
sum is 2 times p times n or 3 times p, where p is k plus 1 and k is number of predictors. So let's say you have three predictors. Let's say you have three predictors. p is 4 because 3 plus 1 is 4. And let's say your sample size is 100. So then 4 divided by 100 is 0 0.04. So you will consider a case of high leverage if it has value of 0.04. Or you may want to use this one also, smaller sample size. Or again, look for four or five largest leverage values when you run frequency and see if they look anomalous from the rest of the class. See if they look anomalous. So often what I do, everybody, is you run the regression. I run the regression right here. I have two predictors, one under save. I'll go ahead and hit standardized residual. I'll hit leverage right there. And as you know from our prior class, there's your distance, the on point distance. And let me get the standardized residual really quick here. Again, using the same standardized residual. And there's your this. And there's your leverage. And a lot of times what I do everybody is I will just run the statistics. There's leverage there, standardized residual. Run the descriptives to see which ones are the biggest and the smallest. And we know that the mean, the minimum is 0.09. I mean the maximum, 0.09. And maybe see if there's a few. See if there's a few that are kind of larger than others. So you go to frequency, go to frequency, Put in center leverage, standardized residual. Take a look at the frequencies. Leverage, let's look for the biggest waves. Okay, I see there's a 0 0.09, 0 0.08, 0 0.75, so I see a few large ones, and maybe well over the 0 0.04. So I mean, look at the top ones and see what's going on with those individuals for leverage. For standardized residuals, the standardized residuals, there is that. And let's see. And let's also do, let's also put in standardized residual. Standardized residual, I see a pretty large naked one, maybe 2.84. So it's less than our 3.0, but I still may want to look at that this I may also want to look at the negative 2.5 frame. So I'll look at kind of the largest and the smallest. Now sometimes when you have a large database survey, if you want to look at a frequency table, it's going to stop at the 100 row. So sometimes you have to double click on the table. Sometimes you may have to double click. And you can go right here, which will take you to the end. And I see the largest positive is 2.56. So you know what, I have a few ones that I'm going to just examine. Just examine. Just to kind of see what's going on. Getting a feel for the model. So that's outliers on the outcome is the standardized residual. Outlier on the set of, uh, set of predictors is called Hats matrix or leverage. Closely related is Mahomboy distance. If you recall from 6022. As you recall from 602 Mahomboy distance, it's basically related to leverage in so far leverage times n minus 1 is modeling distance. So let me show you here, everybody. If I took long point distance, leverage, if I took 0 0.00824 times 15 minus 1, it will give you long point distance. And what the heck is this? What is small point distance? Again, it focuses on the predictors. It focuses on the predictors. And it indicates how far the case is from the centroid of all cases for the predictors. The 
the sedge right and to get is how far the case is from the sedge right. And I'm going to show you what that means. How far the case is from the sedge. And I know that sounds almost a little Star Trek-y. Okay, darn it, get those sedge rights. So basically, what it is, is now in a multivariate, in a multivariate design, Maybe a means of x1, maybe means of x2, maybe mean of x3, and then maybe you have Ross right there, x1. Maybe you have Zach. I'm going to call this <coughs> I bless you, I1. Zach, maybe over here. I2. Here you have space. Really, maybe close. So you can see how far they are. How far they are. And these are what's called centuries. Essentially, essentially, what it takes into account, mongoloid distance, seen formula, the text is a function. mean vector and S, which is variance, covariance matrix. Remember from chapter two, everybody? Chapter two, where we were over a mean vector? So, it takes mean minus, basically, as you can see in the formula, it takes the mean, or the score from an individual, so it takes X minus X minus mean for x for the individual and basically divides by s divides by s which is the variance covariance matrix and it takes the transpose of it so that's not the full formula everybody that's what it takes into account. So it's kind of like a letter, everybody. So this seems to be somewhat similar to z score, doesn't it, everybody? Except the denominator is unstandardized. Because right? S is a variance covariance matrix, it's not standard deviations. So it gets up. It gets at multivariate distance. It gets at multivariate di distance, which you will find is reported in De Carlo's map, where it gives you log wide distance for biggest outliers. So that being said, everybody, here's your evidence. And mod by distance is a function of leverage. Look what the correlation is. 1.0. Mod by distance, which is same as PSS and leverage. So, I know what you're thinking right now. Why would I ever use one if they're redundant? If one is a function of the other. The one reason why is on page 108. There's a nice table in your text that can test for significance. Leverage is not tested for significance. I'm not aware of a significance test for leverage values since max number is 1.0. But there's a nice table in there that you can see on page 108. If I have three predictors, if I have alpha of 0.05, if I have a sample size of 100, does everybody see my critical value? of 16.45. Is there a bit see? We all have this. We have a We all have a And there you have. We can test it for significance. We can actually test it. It's a type of chi-square distribution. So it's kind of nice as you can test while well, avoid distance for significance. In other words, you have these numbers right here. For instance, let's look at this individual. Let's look at that outlier. 
It had a standardized residual, and it's got a long point distance of 6.04, which is not the biggest one. The biggest one is actually this sucker right here. This one is the biggest outlier on predictors. So look, 19 on depression, highest score, and 58 on pulse, which is kind of in the middle. So you can actually test these for significance. kind of nice for long way distance. So again, how to get all this in regression? You do analyze, regression, linear, and go into save, and there's long way distance right there. Now let's talk about Cook's distance. Let's talk about influence. Just because you have an outlier on X or Y doesn't mean and it influences the equation of the other. Just because you have an outlier in X or Y doesn't mean you influence the coefficients of the equation. In other words, if CRE equals 3.23 or leverage equals 0.098, it doesn't mean for the I case. For the I case. That it impacts the solution. So notice, look at this. Predicted Y is 10 plus 5, depression plus 3 pulse. And I delete the man who's an outlier via leverage. In your opinion, if I do y and minus one, is that a big change in the solution? In your opinion, is it changing the intersect from 10 to 9.8, from the slope from 5 to 4.8? Is that a big change in the no? Which means it may be an outlier, but it doesn't mean it's an influential case. It doesn't mean it's an influential case. So again, Cook's distance, page 109 is a measure of the change in the coefficients that occur if the case were omitted. So you can get an idea of influence. Generally, a Kirk's distance greater than 1.0 might be a point of influence. Again, no hard and fast rules. However, for large, from in-class data set, if I use cutoff of 1.0, here are the largest five as follows. So this is from the in-class data set. 0.12, that's the largest. But what I tend to do, as I already said, is I don't adhere to any strict cutoff. I get a feel for the largest ones and see if they're separated from the rest. Right? Because what if you had something like, like, look, I see two. For instance, I see two of them that are, I see two of them that are greater than 0.10. So maybe investigate those. Maybe. So when all is said and done, everybody, I've done my due diligence. I've looked at standardized residuals, which is called discrepancy. I've looked at leverage, which is outliers on predictors. I've looked at Cook's distance, CD, which is influence. I may and may analyze data with and without the one or two outliers and compare it to the full data set. But if I decide there's not a big difference, you know I'm going to leave them in or exclude them. I need you've got to check. Just leave them in. Absolutely. But what this shows you is a lot of work goes into really making sure you've diagnosed the model properly. So I've had sometimes students, dissertation students, or clients think I'll just run the regression and see how it goes. They don't realize how much work there is. Looking at, looking at plots, looking at linearity, looking at outliers, looking at the residuals. I mean, there's a lot that goes into making sure that you're properly fitting a regression model. Just so you know, there are other residuals. There's studentized residual. It's called internally and externally studentized, some that use the mean square of the error. Here you'll see studentized residual as a 1.0 correlation with the standardized. A lot of times they're not that radically different, but there are other residuals, everybody. There are other residuals. Let me just show you a couple here. Let me show you a couple right here. 
analyze aggression, linear, and then under say there's student ties, deleted, student ties deleted. or the internal student ties, and then you get the student ties to lead it. What would happen if you deleted that case? So there's a lot you can get here. Usually they're not too radically different, right? A lot of times they're very similar. But this one sometimes uses the, the mean square. So usually, you guys, you'll be fine for this class to use the standardized residual. But sometimes people do like the internally or externally student ties residual. Rarely do they tell that different of a story. And I'm not sure if the further the book maybe briefly discusses them. I'm not sure. If you're at all interested, everybody, I actually have the hand calculations for all the different residuals in this little output. I didn't put in the notes. But if you're at all interested, see how they're calculated by hand, you're welcome to come back to class and I can show you. I don't think for this class I really need to go deep into it. I don't think it'll amplify that much. And just one last thing that you do get, everybody that you do get, that's closely related. So now we're almost done with everything I'm saying. You get this DF betas, DF fit. What the heck is that? Look if I ran two predictors. If I ran two predictors, let me clean this up a little bit. The thing is, if you run the same model multiple times, it's going to keep spitting out all the same statistics. So you want to make sure. Okay, so here's the standardized residual, long bones distance, Cook's distance. And do you see the scenes called DF? Basically what it does is, here's the one for the intercept, exercise, health maintenance. What the heck are these? It means how much does the intercept change? How much does the slope of the first predictor change? How much does the slope of the second change if I delete it? So they're basically called, they're, they basically are like omitted case statistics. And they show you specifically, specifically given the intercept, given the slope, given the slope of the second predictor, how much it changes that. I'll be honest, I rarely use them in FM. In fact, I, I, I don't ever use them. I use leverage. I use Cook's distance. I use these global statistics every project I'm on. I rarely am that interested in seeing exactly how much it changes for ROS. But that could be interesting if you want to do that type of microanalysis. If you want to do that type of microanalysis. So now, at least for your homework, everybody, minimally what you want to look at, at least, is look at influence, look at discrepancy, the residuals, and look at leverage. And look at the largest values. I've given you a couple of rules of thumbs for leverage. They can see if they're an outlier or not. Cook's distance, again, some people say if it's greater than 1.0, I think mean, that's a little liberal. That's one option. And that'll be good enough. That'll be good enough, everybody. And I'll, again, go over this before the end of the class. So I know we've had all this in 6022, so it's kind of a review again, but I just wanted to go over it again. The last part the book gets into is sample size for reliable prediction equation. I just read a review that kind of did the same problem with power analysis. Some people have used many, 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 many uh, rules of thumbs. Get 10 people per predictor. If I have four predictors, get 40. Well, it really varies. It varies what type of regression model you're going to have. For instance, here's a, power, a one program, power and precision. If I have four predictors and I want a power point eight, my model R square is 13%, I need 85 people. So much for getting 40. So do you see the problem with almost any rule of thumb? And I've gone over power a lot in our first lecture. I shared with you the power analysis presentation I recently did. And it really matters 
what type of regression model you're doing, the effect size. If you're doing a hierarchical regression approach, 10% at the first step, 3% at the second, you're going to need a much larger sample size. So again, everybody, when you do a power analysis, make sure it corresponds to the exact model that you're testing. The exact model. And here in G-Power, the same results. It's crazy. G-Power, as you know, is free. You can download it from the web. I put in four predictors. I put in about 13% of the variance, which translates to this effect size called F squared, 14. 85 people, they get the same result. They get the same result from the freely available software. However, again, be mindful that if you have four predictors, this is only testing significance from the full model, not the individual predictors. <coughs> if you have a hierarchical model, it's not testing the incremental R squared, which could be very different. And as I showed you before, as I showed you before, as an example, to open my power analysis, but as usual, we have IT problems here. So that's not going to happen. But if you look at the power analysis PowerPoint that I did ahead, you'll see an example of a hierarchical model versus regression at the same R square. But one at 13%, one at 10%, then three. One said you need 85 people, the next at 277. Huge difference. Huge difference in sample size. So please be mindful about that. And we'll get to logistic regression later on at the end of the semester when you're going to compare it to discriminative function analysis. The chapter finishes off with logistic. What if you have a binary outcome? If you have a dichotomous outcome, that's logistic regression. This was from, I actually, I actually submitted something to PSYOP. I was rejected. And I think I took off a little too much. I was going to do a tutorial. I talk about all these different regression modules. And the students, they said, this is nice, but it goes way beyond the two hours you propose. Because what I thought would be interesting for SLAO is to, it's called Beyond Regression. And uh, I made it to say Beyond Rejection. And so they did that. <laughs> but I was going to talk about binary logistic model, how it fits with generalized linear models, the binary outcomes. So I was going to talk about probit regression when you have normally distributed errors. I was going to talk about multinomial logistic, where you have three or more categories. I was going to talk about Poisson, where through DV is what's called a count. One absence, two absence, three absence. And what if you have a lot of zeros? Zero inflated Poisson regression. And then I was going to discuss its neighbor called negative binomial regression. As you know, none of these are in the book, except for uh, uh, binary regression. I was going to talk about sensor versus truncated outcomes. What if you have an ordinal outcome? Low risk, medium risk, high risk. I was going to discuss proportional odds modeling. What if your outcome is a proportion? What per per percent of the time do you enjoy your job? And you give me a zero and a hundred percent. Technically, the DV is a proportion, and you can do what's called beta regression. So I was going to discuss all of these techniques. They said that would be, I probably should have pared it down a little. So there are many, many regression techniques. Here, even though multiple regression is a multivariate technique, here you're really getting introduced to your first technique that has multiple outcomes, which is at the end of this chapter, called multivariate regression. Here's your, really your first kind of multivariate technique with multiple outcomes on page 128. So, what if you have a set of predictors and a set of outcomes? So now for the first time, everybody, you not only have multiple x's, you also have multiple what? Y's. So what if I have exercise, diet, and health maintenance as my predictors, social influence, self-confidence, and self-efficacy self as my predictor? So how do you do this, everybody? In SPSS, you've got to use the multivariate option. You 
go to the multivariate option, analyze, general linear model, multivariate, put your multiple outcomes here, put your multiple predictors in the covariate box. Remember I said some of those predictors are called covariates when they're continuous? And this is multivariate regression, everybody. So here, I'm going to regress my three outcomes on my three covariates, or three predictors. So then you get your first multivariate test that we're going to really talk about when we get to Vandova. But here, I get a test of significance on the linear combination of the predictors. Social influence, self-confidence, self-efficacy. This is the predictor. What? Predictor 2, predictor 3. And remember, we have three outcomes. So this is how well social influences predicts the linear combination of three outcomes, three DDs, that are logically clustered. They logically make sense. Do you see we have significance? That 11 percent is accounted for. Self-confidence is a significant predictor of the linear combination of three outcomes. And self-efficacy is significant. So above we see that all the predictors significantly predict the linear combination of the DDs, which is exercise, diet, nutrition, and health. So now everybody, you've got, even though multiple regression is a multivariate technique, for the first time you've been introduced, so we have multiple outcomes. Multiple outcomes. And then you can get more specific. This is all within the MANOVA, and I'm going to show you how to do MANOVA in the next chapter. Here's social influence. See which of the outcomes it predicts. You can see social influence significantly predicts exercise and health, but not diet. Does everybody see that? So this looks like just a regression. I mean, the regression could kind of reverse. Here's self-confidence predicts diet and health, and self-efficacy predicts all three. So now you've really gone from a multivariate where you have multiple x's, multiple y's. Then you see how much x predicts each linear combination of y. Then how well x predicts each y. To really drill down. So above we see that diet does not predict social influence. Exercise doesn't predict self-confidence. So again, think of this way, everybody. We have drilled down. down from multiple x's preventing multiple y's and then each x predicting a linear combination of the y's and then how each x predicts each one, right? Does everybody see how we've gone from that? I mean, the best way to show this visually is you can get a test. You have x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3. Here's your x's, here's your y. And you may want to see, does this linear combination predict the linear combination? Then you may want to see if x1 predicts a linear combination. And then you see if x1 predicts individually. And guess what? That's, that, that is really the, pit, the epitome of a multivariate technique. Of a multivariate technique. However, everybody, I was mildly chagrined. Thank you. Did you already know? Well done. Thank you. Ready to see me fall and have a document, and now you're trying to make that. So, that being said, with the GLM option, I wanted to get a true multivariate test of significance where I saw that first step, and it doesn't give it to you. But using the MANOVA language, the old MANOVA, everybody, the old MANOVA, which we used to use in the old days, you can only talk. Exercise, diet, health maintenance, with social influence. The with, as you recall from that cohort, is the global term for covariate. And look, everybody, 
I get a global test of significance right here. Do you see it's called the multivariate test of significance? Here it is. This shows me the linear combination of x's predict the what, everybody? Linear combination of y's. You don't get, for some weird reason, you don't get this in the GLM option. But you do get this. 21, 16, 23. Right for exercise, diet, and health maintenance. You get each of those. So I just want to show you. The above shows a linear combination of predictors and DVs are significant. So if someday, everybody, you should have the opportunity to do a multivariate regression. Let's say you're on a project. We have job involvement, job engagement, and job stress to predict maybe three performance indices. Instead of doing all these separate regressions, you can do a multivariate regression. And if you want to get the one big multivariate test, you do have to use the Mandoka to get this part, to get this part. And that's multivariate regression, everybody. And that's multivariate regression. So again, I know a lot of this has been reaction this chapter just to get you back in speed for multiple regression. But here, and it's pasted on the on the uh, notes for homework. We're going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and have you. I didn't. Okay, I see. I did. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, I realized that homework one used to be running to Carlos method. So, here, I'm going to have you use three predictors. Let's go ahead and think about what I'm going to have you do for your homework. So we uh, do I have the data? I do have you do have the data. Q O L survey multi homework practice. Is that I believe that is. I believe that is on Google. So what I'd like you to do, everybody, let's think about this. We've got this. Get familiar with the database. I've mean, got these items that have to do with psychological well-being. You don't have to do any data clean. The, the data is all clean and scrub. Social support, leisure, spirituality, health, and environment. This is going to be a great database also for uh, doing homework and structured equation modeling. Lots of demos. And I've got scale scores. I've already done the reverse coding and the scale score. Everything is done. What I'd like you to do, everybody, is let's go ahead and have social support, psychological well-being, and health. Psych well-being, social support. Let's see which one. Three predictors, psychological well being. Three predictors, health. We'll go ahead and have listed psych well being, psych well being, social support, and health. Okay, so those are going to be your three predictors, everybody. And you see the scales, they're the scales for cycle B, social support, and health. And you're going to go ahead and use predictors. And these are all scale scores. All scale scores. And your outcome, which is problematic, is an ordinal outcome. So everything may not be perfectly for almost elasticity, but overall, I have a high quality life. Item 24, it's right there, so use that as your item. And there's one thing I want you to realize that part of this was homework one. So you're going to get, this is going to be kind of two homeworks in one. So for homework, which will be two in one, okay? I 
I'm sorry, this is going to be homework to I want you to use the DiCarlo macro. Remember the macro we discussed that's in the notes? I want you to use it for those three, for the three predictors. Use the DiCarlo macro for the three predictors. So this is actually going to be homework number two. I'm going to give you two homeworks to do next week. So I really wanted to finish this lecture. So you're going to want you to use the Carlo macro for the three predictors and discuss skewness, kurtosis, and multivariate skewness, kurtosis, and normality. Again, I've given, if you look at the notes, everything, again, just going back to the notes if that helps. As long as you, looking at the notes, this will show you how to use this syntax. Go ahead, Edward, there's the test of multivariate kurtosis. I'm fine with you using the smallest test high-score test. And using small is as fine, it tends to be sensible conservative. But you get a test of multivariate skew, multivariate kurtosis, and the big one, multivariate normality, which is kind of cool you can do that on SPSS. And, as you know, there are gives you the five largest modeling systems, and it shows you the cases that are most problematic. And now you know what model weight distance is from a regression, uh, regression lecture. So again, everybody, go through the notes. And what you'll do is you're going to use the same database. You'll save it in the directory. But you just save, right? You just save this in the directory. Right? You save the syntax file, which is on. The syntax file is there on Moodle. And then, learn test, you just use the syntax. You use an include statement which invokes the macro, and then it's two lines of code. Just the three variables, your test variables, right? So, again, so, homework, so we two of them, two separate. Use predictors, all scale scores, going to be homework number two. I want to use the Carlo macro, don't forget, and two lines of code. Right? You're going to have the include statement and then the norm test errors. That's all there. It's really simple. You can literally cut and paste lines right there. Right? two lines of code. Right, and I'll have that there. And put it wherever you save your database, right? First, the include statement is where you save the syntax file. The syntax file, right, from Moodle. And the second line code is the command for your tests of normality, etc. So, so just have a brief review of normality, univariate, and multivariate. Just so you look at pictures, look at histograms. So look at histograms from SPSS. SPSS. And then multiple. So it's going to be cool, everybody. This macro is something you can use throughout the semester and for your own work, your dissertation.
where you can do a multivariate test of normality. So that would be homework number two. So it's going to be two homeworks every day. And then add for homework three, which is multiple regression. Outcome is follows. You're going to conduct simultaneous regression. So if you went to, you could do hierarchical if justified. Conduct right? simultaneous multiple regression using the same predictors. Using the same three predictors. From homework two. So you don't have to look at skews, cartels, and all that stuff again. We've already done it. So how did we do for R squared as well as the individual predictors? Any problems with collinearity, no tolerance, inflammations, and of course, examine diagnostics. Look at your <coughs> residuals, questions. Excuse me. Look at almost elasticity. Look at discrepancy. You know, 2.0. You know, or, or the largest one, right? 2.0, right? Or 3.0, or maybe you know, 2.5. See if there's any outliers. Leverage. You can use 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Or look, at, or look at the highest ones, and influence, consistence. You know, 1.0, greater than 1.0 is influence. Those still look at the largest values, even if less than the count. And tell me a story, summarize your model. What recommendations would you make? So I wanted to finish the lecture on multiple regression correlation before a sign homework two, so you know what model one distance is. I want to make sure, because otherwise you would have no idea what that is from the first one. So, you have two homeworks. Do so next week. Next week. Well, two weeks. Two weeks. We don't There's no we class. Don't have, it's, it's a good time. Uh, yeah. I know, really good. So that's your homeworks, everybody. Are you going to have that to the Yes, it's the process. Yes, this will be on the Moodle one. So now, that is your two homeworks too. So what's kind of cool, everybody, is once you use DiCarlo's method, you're going to now be able to test your dissertations multivariate normality. You're going to actually be able to test that, which is pretty nice because I don't know if many people do that. You know, because you have to invoke that macro. So again, you have two homeworks, one with multiple regression and one basically looking at some of the assumptions. So there you're looking at a lot of assumptions. Right? And the homeworks, and both homeworks, tie in assumptions. Right? Both homeworks tie in assumptions. So they both, the reason why I'm not doing this is one homework, instead of two is just to give you the opportunity to basically turn out to the You'll do well on that. In the output, everybody, I don't need Be frugal with what a pen in the homework. I don't need every SPSS table, right? Be, let's get, be frugal with it, everybody. I don't need every SPSS table. If you want to put in a couple, that's fine, right? Maybe you will create your own APA style table for, for results style table for results. But I don't need, I don't need every single table. It's not necessary. So again, you will have in two separate homeworks. So you will have in two separate homeworks. And this will be posted on the Any questions? Questions? Let's go ahead and open. Let's move on to chapter four. And we were right on schedule. Very, very happy. What if I have two or more TVs with a fixed factor? Right? What if you have a with a fixed factor? Male versus female. Training versus no training. Multi-variant regression, 
has continuous level predictors, right? Motif variant regression has continuous level predictors, often called, what are they often called, everybody? Covariances. So if you have two or more DVs, you could do two one-way NOVAs, but what error is inflated? I go ahead and do two one-way NOVAs, what error is inflated? Family-wise? You're close. Not quite family-wise is what we said type 1. Right? Test someone to remind me what type 1 is, it's the probability of what? Uh, rejecting the null when the null is false. Rejecting the null when the null is true. Is true. Saying that there's no there is something there when there is Precisely. So, this is when we turn into MANOVA. There are two reasons which should be interested in using more than one DD. One, any treatment is page 145 worth its salt will affect the subjects in more than one way. Hence the need for several criteria, multiple loss. Number two, through the use of several criteria measures, we can obtain a more complete detailed description of the phenomenon under investigation. So why would we want to do a multivariate analysis for what's called multivariate ANOVA? Type 1 error is decreased. See, the thing is, if I do a bunch of ANOVAs, the error does get compounded. Right? It's no longer just 0.05. It's much higher than that for type 1 error. So type 1 error is decreased. Number two, the univariate tests ignore important information, which is the what, everybody? Correlations among the what? If you run the one-way NOVA, what are you ignoring? Correlations amongst the DVs. Right? Which MANOVA captures. Right? So if I run three separate, if I run three separate one-way novas, is there anything there procedurally that will capture the relationship of the DVs? No, you're running them separately. Mm -hmm. But a ANOVA will capture that information. It'll also examine the joint combination of the DVs. Of the joint, or what I will often call everybody, the linear combination of the DVs. I'm going to all frequently call the linear combination. So which means is although the groups may not be differentiating the variables individually, jointly they may be, you may find you may find a one-way ANOVA for DV equals job performance is not significant for two groups. But when it is part of a linear combination. Of multiple measures of job performance, the MANOVA may be significant. What does that mean? It means by itself, you may not find something. But once it's part part of this constellation of variables. It may be significant. And that's something you wouldn't get from a NOVA. And then you can do subtest analysis, like reading, writing, spelling. You can look at certain, there's a whole thing called profile analysis. So what you should see is that a MANOVA is much more flexible than a NOVA, and you get a much broader scope. So it starts to become something like this. Right? It starts to become, you have multiple Right. So, with multivariate regression, you have x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. Right, you have multiple x's and multiple y's. And MANOVA, you have multiple Y's. And at the minimum, at the minimum, you have what, everybody? A 
takes factor with how many levels? Two. Yes, we've got two levels. But you soon you're going to see you can have interactions, you can have all types of things, covariates, you can do a Mancova, which you need to practice with. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to do this. From Tabachnik and Fidel, the NOVO works best with highly negatively correlated DBs and acceptably well with moderately correlated DBs in either direction. It's less attractive if correlations are very highly positive or near zero. So it's kind of weird. There's been some studies that have been done when that NOVO works best. I mean, you should still let logic dictate the Magnova. Well, look at it. I have a job engagement survey, job involvement, and I have a job commitment. Those may all be kind of strongly positive, but they logically seem to go together, don't they? They logically make up a set of outcomes. But just so you know, this is when Magnova has the most power. It's also, Magnova is pretty much wasteful using very highly positively correlated DVs is wasteful, or DVs are uncorrelated. However, there should still be statistical and theoretical coherence, right? It should still make sense. You know, for example, you may find job involvement, job engagement, and job commitment are highly correlated, hence maybe, comp maybe compromising to some degree power in MANOVA. But logically, do they make sense? But logically, they make perfect sense. They make perfect sense as a constellation of outcomes. So, when we come back, we're going to get to the computation. In the old days, in the old days, I had this beautiful, beautiful, it puts tears in my eyes because you won't be doing it by hand. But you'd be one of the few people in San Diego that would be doing it by hand. This on the camera, so you see. Look, you do all the matrix algebra. Look, Ross is getting a little weak. The matrix algebra, you're going to be taking the determinant of the variance covariance matrix box. You think you'd add in suppression to your lexicon? But you will not have to if I have. Now it's just extra credit. What? Now it's just extra credit. Right? I mean, I have to do extra credit. <laughs> but I will show it to you. I know you can say, why do I have to at least even give and see an example? Just once you see it done by hand for a sample size of five, you'll see it's not a black box. But you will not have to do it by hand, you'll just do it on the computer. But when you come back from your wonderful time off, we'll, um, which is next Monday, we'll go ahead and segue to add calculation for that number. With that, again, you guys, you have two, basically two homeworks in one. But it's two separate ones. One, again, is the DiCarlo, the macro, the assumptions within the normality, the skewness, ketosis, and then the multiple regression. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, and we will see you. Good.